How's everyone doing this morning? Doing well? Come on, I know it's daylight savings. I actually thought we're gaining an hour. When uh, it was announced last week, I'm like, yes! And I'm speaking that morning, extra hour, how good's that? And then Talia's like, man, you got that wrong. And I'm like, oh, here we go. But caffeine has been my friend. I trust it's been your friend this morning. Take a seat, give someone a high five. It is so good to be in church. And uh, if you're online joining us this morning, a massive welcome to you, or maybe for yourself, you're new, fresh to this environment, you've never really been in an environment like this before. It's absolutely our honor uh, to have you here. And maybe you're exploring faith, exploring uh, who Jesus is, and what a Sunday to come to, where we're talking about around the why the Bible. It's important to know our whys. It's been important, really, the last little season that we've gone on this journey, just going, why? Why do we do what we do? You've heard it said many times, but, you know, we can get caught up in in the notion of going from what to what to what. How do we do it? What do we do? But we always have to carry in ourselves a conviction of the why. I love that having a strong why brings a passion to our what. And any person in any sphere of society that carries a passion in their area of life, they carry a strong why. Any athlete that goes into a race who's wanting to win, who competes on the world stage, they carry a why. That's where that passion comes from. And for us as Christians, we have to carry a why. We have to carry a conviction. So I'm excited today to talk around why the Bible, and I trust that it's really gonna inspire us in our faith. I believe today God's gonna reignite something for some of us, maybe challenging, but it's not about measuring up. It's not about feeling like, you know what, we're not doing this well. It's about walking away from today going, you know what, God, I wanna have a passion in my heart. I wanna have a hunger for your word. God wants us to fall in love with his word. It's not there so that we can tick the box. It's not there so that we can get to Wednesday and go, I feel like I'm a good Christian this week because I've read my Bible. No, it's there so that we would have a love relationship with our Father, amen? Why don't we give the band a hand they can... As we get in, but Father, I thank you for today, God. I pray, Lord, that in all of our hearts, in all of our worlds, wherever we're at, in our journey with the Bible, Holy Spirit, I just pray that today you would, you would speak to us afresh, that you would ignite something in our hearts, a passion for your word, in Jesus' mighty name. Everyone said? Amen. 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 Well, maybe you've heard a few of these things before around the Bible, or maybe you're fresh, but if you don't know, the Bible is a collection of books. It's not just one book, but it's a collection of 66 books. Uh, it's written by 40 human authors, but we believe it's been inspired by God. Those 40 authors, under the inspiration uh, of God, wrote and penned the very words of God. And it's important to, to know this. It's important for us to understand this, the context of how the Bible was written, because it was written across three continents. It was written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. It was written over 1,600 years. Incredible. 400 years, there was a gap between the Old Testament and the New being written. And when you read the Bible, you're going to find a bunch of different genres. You're going to find that there's narrative, there's, uh, there's biography, there's like a hist- historical narrative to it. You're going to find po- poetry, you're going to find the wisdom uh, books, you're going to find that there's law, there's God instructing us on the ways of life. You're going to find the Gospels, epistles, of how the church is to run, to operate, of, of God speaking to his bride. And then you'll find prophecy. You'll find apocalyptic uh, scripture that will talk about what's to happen in the age to come. Come on, aren't you thankful that we serve a God who hasn't you know, left us blindfolded to what's to come, but he speaks to us and he says, there's a new heaven. There's a new earth coming. In fact, the old way is going to pass away. And I don't know about you, but sometimes life gets hard. And the incredible thing is that we can look to the end where God says, you know what? You're on the winning team. There will be no more tears. There will be no more suffering. There will be no more disease. There will be no more sickness. Come on, what Jesus did on the cross was come to wrap it all up, take us to heaven, and set us free and give us complete victory. What's incredible is that in this collection of books is that there is not one contradiction. There has never been one complication found in it. No historical errors have ever been found. It maintains a consistent message from Genesis to Revelation. Its authenticity and divine inspiration is without question. 
And even Jesus coming, the Old Testament has 300 prophecies throughout it speaking about how he would come, what he would do, where he would come from. And Jesus fulfilled 300 prophecies. There's been calculations done on this reality for some, one man to, to fulfill over 300 prophecies and the calculator broke. You literally couldn't calculate it. It's pretty much impossible that one man would do that. It's estimated that over five billion copies have been made worldwide. Over 100 million are made and sold every single year. And it is also the most stolen book. <laughs> we know that here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> new Bibles are for new people. Just FYI. <laughs> they do look good. They look, they're very beautiful. But the ultimate purpose for God's word is that we would know him, discover who he is, have a relationship with him. It's God's story of how he relates to humanity, past, present, future. I love that as you read the Bible, you read the story of creation. We see that God creates the earth, the universe, the animals, mankind, and we're the center of creation. That God creates us in his image. But we see that the reason we have these problems in the world today is because we fell. We, went, we, we, we bought the lie of the enemy, and we've continued to fall ever since, but throughout the Old Testament, we see that God is after his people. He creates relationship, covenant with a man named Abraham. He says, I'm gonna make you into a great people. I'm gonna make you a special people, and it wasn't to be exclusive. God chose the people of Israel so that he could bless the world, so that through Israel, he could come and reach and redeem the world. Right from the very beginning, God had the end in mind. He comes, we see the Gospels, Jesus comes, and I love that the Bible is still breathing, speaking, talking to our very day to day, to our relationships, to how we operate in our business, our school, our university, and that God's desire is that we would live with a strong foundation. And as I said before, he speaks to our future hope. But the Bible is like a tree. It's probably one of my favorite analogies. It's like a big tree. Maybe picture a maple tree, if you know what a maple tree is. And it's important for us to see the context of the Bible in that view because sometimes we need to see the big picture. Sometimes we need to go pull a leaf off, one scripture, study it, get it in us. But it's important that we don't just, you know, go off on one scripture, but that we see the whole Bible, that it interconnects with itself, that scripture interprets scripture. And the tension can be, as we start to walk out our journey with Jesus, is that we disqualify ourselves. I don't know about you, but I didn't do too well in school, so I didn't read books. Uh, I wasn't a book guy, but when I came to Jesus, I thought, how am I, how, I'm gonna be pretty overwhelmed by this. How do I get this into me? In fact, I would look around at other people and their journeys and how well they could eloquently speak about Scripture, and I thought, maybe, you know, I'll never get there or maybe I'll never be like that. And you know what? We just don't need to compare ourselves to someone else. We just need to come to this word and go, you know what, this is the word that God wants to build a strong foundation, wants to bring health into my life. God wants to speak into me. Before we get into the whys, there's three main reasons of why nots that people disqualify themselves or don't get into the, the Bible. The first is it comes down to priority and time. We believe that we don't have enough time on our day. Can I just say and challenge us? Come on, we've got to make priority. We've got to make time. It is worth it. Some of us, it's confusion. We just get confused in it. Sometimes we just need more scripture and the confusion goes away. For some of us, it's misunderstanding. It's like, how do I wrestle this out? What I love about the Bible is we're not called to do it in isolation, but we're called to do it as a community. Come on, if there's things that are confusing, let's talk it out. Let's walk it out. No matter where we're at, let's discover and grasp our why. Because his word will strengthen you. It will direct you. And ultimately, it's going to bring you closer to who Jesus is. So this morning, I'm going to give us five whys to build our conviction around why the Bible. You ready? Number one, it's God's word. Someone say, it's God's word. God's word. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, that all scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, so that the servant, so us, the servant of God, may be thoroughly equipped, so that we'd be equipped. It's God's word. It's infallible. Its authenticity is unmatched. 
It's his authority. Come on, it's how he speaks to us. For some of us, we've got to get into his word a little bit more because he's speaking through his word. And he doesn't speak contrary to his word. For some of us, we're like, is God saying this or is God saying that? Or should I do this or should I do that? Come on, if we have a strong foundation in his word, there's a security to what God is saying. Come on, it's holy, it's perfect. Psalm 12, 6 says, the words of the Lord are flawless. Like purified in a crucible, it's like gold refined seven times. Come on, this has to be the crux of our conviction, that it ultimately is his word. The Bible compares his word as it's like a sword, it's like a fire, it's like milk that brings us sustenance, it's like a mirror that will show us where we're at, it's like a seed, it's like a lamp, it's like a hammer. Come on, sometimes we need the hammer of God's word just to bring breakthrough to the challenge and circumstance that's in front of us. Hebrews 4, 12 puts it like this, says, for the word of God is living and active. It's alive, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joint and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Come on, it sharpens us. It sharpens our purpose. It sharpens our parenting. I need that. <laughs> with a two going on 30 year old, <laughs> saying no, flat stick. Come on, in our careers, in, I'm, I'm learning, I'm on the go. But in our careers, come on, it sharpens us. Come on, how we outwork his church together, it sharpens us. Come on, how we treat each other, it sharpens us. Come on, in our marriage, it sharpens us. Our relationships, our friendships, God's word is coming to come towards the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. James 1 says, in 21 says, therefore rid yourselves of all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and in humility receive, hear this, the word implanted, which is able to save our souls. Come on, it's, it's not good versus bad. It's not, God's not saying, hey, measure up. God's saying, hey, there's life here. It's life versus death. There's life in my word. Come on, we're not doing it to tick a box. I've fallen into this trap many times, especially as I, in my early journey of following Jesus, it was like, man, if I read my Bible every day this week, I've ticked the box, I've done well. No, it's about getting there and getting life out of it. Yeah. Going, God, this, you're the architect of life. You're the creator of life. Come on, you're the healer. You're the deliverer. And sometimes we just need a fresh word for breakthrough because it contains life for all of us. Amen? Yeah. Number two, why the Bible? It's trustworthy and reliable. Come on, I love that God's word can be, tr- can be trusted, that it's reliable, that it can be tested. Come on, in a culture with so many questions and critics against faith, it's imperative we know the why behind why we trust it. Many times I've heard people say, I don't know, maybe you've heard this before, but how can I put my faith or how can I put my trust in something that's been written by human hands? How can I, how can I trust that it hasn't changed? Well, we can look back at the evidence that's in front of us and see that it has not changed, that it does not lie. And I just want to look at a few areas that prove its trustworthiness. We can look at some Bible, uh, some old Bible records, two sources in particular today I want to look at that will actually give us a trust. I don't know if you've heard of the Septuagint, but a Greek Egyptian king, Ptolemy Philadelphus, I think I got that right. He commissioned in around the third century a translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, for his library in Alexandria. He got 72 translators from Jerusalem and he sent them to a place to translate the Torah into Koine Greek. He separated them, he put them under a strict regime because he want, uh, reg- regime. He wanted them to come out and go, you know what, this is exactly what's written tr- word for word. And we still have those records from the third century. Not one word has changed. Not so long ago, in 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in Qumran. A guy hanging out, young kid probably. I don't know exactly how old he was, but he was throwing rocks into caves. All the boys out there know what that's about. (laughs) And he heard pottery shatter. He went up to look at what he'd found and he discovered what are now known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were written and dated back to around the same time, 250 BC, preserving most of the Old Testament. In fact, I've seen the scroll of Isaiah 53 that's laid out and it's still preserved in Israel 
which talks about how he was pierced for our tra transgressions, punished for our iniquities. You, you see that and you go, wow, 300 years before Jesus came, the prophetic word, the Old Testament was speaking. These two sources alone, though there are more, show us that we have enough to bank our faith on something that has not changed, that has not moved. His word has been tried and trusted. We can look at uh, the cross-referencing in the Bible. In fact, we've got a picture here to show a couple guys in 2007 just being so amazed at how much cross-referencing there is in the Bible developed this picture. And basically, the bottom line is uh, all the different shades of different books in the Bible and the, the length of them is how long they are. You've got Psalm 119, which is a really long one <laughs> down there. It's doing, doing its bit for the chart. And then this whole rainbow area is how each uh, scripture correlates to another scripture. It's, it's just incredible how much God's word. You've got you to picture this in, in the reality of three continents, three languages, 40 authors, 66 books, 1,600 years, and the Bible is referring to itself over and over again. It proves that there is a God who wrote this. There is a God who inspired this. When you write a book, you write it with the end in mind. But the Bible was written in, in, in real time. It shows that there was an author who knew the end in mind and penned it beyond human intelligence. It's significant. It's so significant. You think about how many other religious books are written by one person in a very small amount of time. Many contradictions. We don't have that. We've got something that we can bank our faith on. Historically, the, the accuracy of the Bible is unlike any other historical document written in history. It's not written to be a historical document. It's not written to give us every amount of history through, through every continent or every town. It doesn't describe magical lands, but it shows real lands, real people. Every road, town, village, people group is accurate historically. Even details like sycamore trees being only in Jericho and no other surrounding places in, in, in that land show the accuracy of God's word. World events outside of this are written about that are in the Bible, recorded in ancient cultures and civilizations, such as Egypt experiencing famines, or their kings uh, interacting with Israel, it's all there. Archaeologically as well, there's so many things being dug up. A few years ago, we went to Israel, and we went to this place called Megiddo, and uh, I've got a photo of it, but we're walking through this, this, um, this, this dug up archaeological site, and it was, a, it, was a, it was a city that King David built. And I, I remember with the tour guide, he goes, all right, someone pull up 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 12. And the, and the scripture says this. It says, the great court had three courses of cut stone all around and a course of cedar beams. And here I am, my hands on the cedar beam, and there's three courses of stone. Everything down to the accuracy of buildings has been written in his word. Come on, it can be trusted it is reliable we can put our faith in it even when it comes to science Isaiah 40 22 says the universe is expanding it is he who sits upon the circle of the earth and it inhabits inhabitants are like grasshoppers it is he who stretches out the heavens like a curtain he spreads them out like a tent to dwell in Job 26 7 the earth hangs on nothing he stretches the north over empty space and he hangs the earth on nothing Come on, the, the Bible's not a scientific book, but it's got accuracy beyond what the authors, beyond what human hands could have known at the time. Thirdly, it's our daily bread. Someone say, it's our daily bread. Why engage? Why read? Why is it worth knowing? Because it's daily bread. It's what we need to sustain us. It's what we need to keep us healthy. It's what we need to keep ourselves engaged and desire after him. Come on, so often the result of not eating good food. All my KFC lovers out there. There's a KFC like literally down the street from my office and I can just smell it. Some, I'm telling you, that chicken speaks to me. But when you're not consuming good things, man, the KFC smells good. Come on, we gotta get into his word because it has what we need. Matthew 4 verse 4, Jesus, he's tempted by the devil. He's alone, he's in the wilderness, he's isolated. He says, it is not written that man shall live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. 
Come on. It was the word that he stood on as his defense. It was the word that he stood on as his weapon against the enemy. You know, when I first came to Jesus, man, I was messed up. I was broken. I would go to school. I'd get on the bus and I'd listen to gangster rap. I'd do it all day. And that stuff just infiltrated my mind. And it didn't give me a good perspective of life. And then I got saved. I found the grace and love of Jesus. And I remember finding this little New Testament Bible. I think it was the Salvation Army one, the little red ones. Has anyone ever seen them, the pocket ones? And I just grabbed that book. This is before, I believe before iPhones, I think. <laughs> a little while ago now. But at the back, it had references and it had different topics that you could go to for things that you were struggling with. And I remember just flipping to the back and getting a highlighter and being like, all right, I've got some addictions. I'm going to highlight that piece. I've got some anger problems. I'm going to highlight that piece. I've got some relational issues. I'm going to highlight that piece. I'm, 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 I'm going through some unforgiveness stuff. I'm going to highlight that piece. And I would get on the bus. I will put some worship music on and I would read that. I will carry it in my pocket. And I'd be like, you know what, that's actually what saw me get breakthrough was that I stood on the Word of God, that I went to the Word of God. I fell in love with the Word of God because it helped me rewrite my ways. Come on, some of us need to get a word. Some of us are just going Sunday to Sunday, but God's saying, hey, would you get a word? Hey, would you get some daily bread? Hey, would you get something to just stand on? Would you get something to have some breakthrough in? Come on, would you get some faith? Because it is still fresh bread. And the truth is, you are what you eat. Old TV show. Very challenging, very challenging title. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says this, The graph withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Joshua 1, 8. Joshua knew this. The, God speaking to him. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do all that is written, written in it. Then I will make your way prosperous then you will have good success. Come on, some of us, what we're desiring is only gonna come out of a place of intimacy with his word. It's day and night. Jesus said that it's the Holy Spirit's job to lead us in his word. In John 14, 26, the help of the Holy Spirit will come whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and he will bring to your remembrance the things I have said to you. Come on, I, I read that and I get challenged because I'm like, what deposit do I have in my life that's fresh? that the Holy Spirit's going to use to speak into my life. Come on, His Word has to be in us. The Holy Spirit isn't leading us into something opposing His Word. I think the more we can get full of His Word, the more we can get led by His Spirit. Amen? And we've got to do it in community together. That's why I love in, in two weeks' time, on, uh, on the 10th, we're going to have five weeks here where we're just jumping into a Bible course on the book of John. No matter where you're at in your journey, I encourage you, if you're going, man, that speaks to me, be there. If you're hungry for his word, be there. We're going to just go after learning and getting into his word together. Four, it refines our life and it defines our worldview. The Bible's like a map for life. I don't know if you've ever been in a foreign country before, traveling somewhere that you've never been and you get a little lost. Anyone out there got a few friends? Doesn't seem like it, maybe just me. A couple of years ago, Tarles and I, we were away, we were in Italy, and um, we, we want, Talia wanted to go to this town in Tuscany because there was this romance movie about this small town, and I thought, okay, we'll do this for you, babe, 100%. I'm not a romance guy, I don't watch rom-coms, rom romantic movies, none of it. I'm just an action guy, um, <laughs> FYI. But um, we're there, and it was the worst day ever with weather. So we get to this town, and it is raining so we're running through, we've got Tommy with us, he's, you know, loving it or hating it, I can't remember, nine month old on a trip's crazy. And so um, we've, we find ourselves somewhere to eat, we have the best steak I've ever had in my life um, for like 10 euro, incredible. And then Talia's like, I'm like, all right, it's time to go, like, we've got to get out of this town, there's not much to see here. And she's like, wait, wait, I want to go see the fountain, it's in the center of the town, we've got to do this, it's on the movie, <laughs> I'll find it on Google Maps. And we've got to go. I go, all right, how far is it? She goes, oh, it's five minutes away. Look, five minutes. I said, sweet. She pin uh, pinpoints the spot on the maps, and we start walking. Fifteen minutes later, we're still walking. Torrential rain. I'm following Talia. She's just got her head down. We're doing this. And I'm like, sure, I think we've gone around this street like ten times. Babe, come here. Come here. Let's, let's have a look at the map. I look down at the map, and 
this fountain is no fountain. It's actually a building. It's got a dome, round shape, roof, and it's blue. I said, baby. I said, there's no fountain here. You're dreaming. It was a great moment. It was a great moment in our marriage, challenging. But all that to say, it's actually imperative that we don't come and project what we want to say in God's map for life, the Bible. It's imperative that we look at it and we go, hey, how am I being refined? Right now, we live in a culture that's redefining what God said. Did God really say? And it can be so easy to get caught up in the culture, which is redefining God's way, redefining God's world. But rather, would we come humbly? Would we come open? Would we come to be shaped? Would we come to be changed? Would we come to be corrected? Would we come to be refined? Would we come and go, God, you've got my worldview. Let, I'm gonna let you define my worldview. Psalm 19 says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More, des more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold sweeter than honey and drippings of honeycomb. Come on, his word is to be desired. His word is, is there to refine us. Psalm 119, 11 says, I store up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Come on, this morning, where do we need to realign our, our lives and go, you know what, I need to be redefined, refined by his word. Come on, is it an area of forgiveness? Is it an area where we need to extend grace? Come on, is it how we're going through some challenging circumstances? God's saying, hey, would you suffer as I suffered? Come on, suffering's a part of our walk. It's not all gonna be perfect, but Jesus has given us a roadmap to do that well. Come on, in our parent parenting, marriage, workplace, as we, as we walk out our relationship with God, are we allowing God to define what that looks like? Or are we going, it's my relationship? Are we coming to worship and worshiping him how he desires? Or do we come and just go, this is how I feel? Come on, I'm challenged by that. That's why I come and I'm lifting my hands every time because the scripture encourages me. In fact, it, it, it tells me, it commands me, this is how God wants to be worshipped. It's how we approach him. Come on, with our worldview, are we seeing with an eternal perspective? Do we have a biblical perspective of justice or just whatever's culturally uh, uh, acceptable and applauded? Come on, when it comes to politics, how, how are we coming to his word? Are we valuing what God values? or just what benefits ourselves? When it comes to gender, sex, marriage, are these being defied by his, defined by his word or by the world? Come on, in our finance, are we coming with our finance saying, God, I wanna honor, honor you. God, I wanna bless others. God, I wanna see my, the next generation that flows from me, I wanna see them blessed. Come on, Jesus says, if you build your life upon my word, you're like a wise builder. When, when the stuff comes, when the storms come, come on, you're gonna stay strong. Come on, it's a journey. We're not arriving, it's a journey. And finally, my last point, why the Bible? Because it is the revelation of Jesus. It's the revelation of Jesus. It all points to him. From the start to the finish, it points to Jesus. It points to him. John 1, 1 says that in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning talking about Jesus with God. All things came into being through him. And apart from him, not one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. And the light, it shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not grasp it. And just a little bit further on, it says this, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the Father. Come on, full of grace and truth. Why the Bible? Because this word is gonna bring you closer to Jesus. Because without his word, we can't see Jesus. Because this word is full of grace and truth. Come on, the Bible says that the, Jesus said, sorry, that the truth will set you free. And we just gotta keep consuming it. We gotta keep putting this in us. We gotta keep coming back. Come on, I don't know about you, 
But on my journey of following Jesus, I've needed grace upon grace upon grace. And this journey following Jesus, we actually don't arrive. It's a journey where we're constantly coming to Him. We're constantly being sharpened by Him. Come on, if we think we've arrived, we've probably just become very stagnant. We're called to be growing. We're called to be following Him. It's been likened, as I said before, to a mirror. It reveals who we really are. It reveals where we're at. But the truth is, is that it's more than a mirror about us. It's a mirror that when we look into this mirror, we actually see Jesus. John 5, 39, Jesus speaking, he says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. But these are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Come on, when we come to the scripture, let's come to Jesus. Let's come to meet with Jesus. When we come to look into the scripture, come on, where is Jesus? Where is he speaking to us? How can we grow in him more? How can we know him more? Come on, how are we loving him more? How can we live in his will more? How can we follow his way more? How can we keep keeping his commands? How are we seeing his heart? Come on, how are we capturing what he captures? Jesus didn't just give us the great commission because of some great work to do. No, it's his heart. It's his heart for humanity, that people would be saved, that people would come to know him. And the truth is, he's using us. We're it. The church. All of us. Every single one of us, from the front to the back, God's got a plan, He's got a purpose for every individual to be reaching people, to be loving people, to extend His grace, His kindness, His mercy. But it's got to come out of a place where we're hungry. It's got to come out of a place of desire. Some of us, some of us feel like we can't hear God. We don't know what He wants for us. Could I suggest we just need more of His Word? He's spoken. He's still speaking but he's speaking in the context of his word. He's speaking in the context of his word. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Further along in Hebrews, it says in 13 verse 8, that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Come on, His Word is real. His Word is relevant. And His Word is alive. It has power. It has grace. It's there for us to bring life. Come on, we've got to stand in a place where we've got a conviction that it is His authority. We can trust it. I mean, if you want to keep going into places uh, uh, and evidence, you could endlessly, we could spend all year talking about the evidence that backs up the Bible. But there's a place where we have to settle that and go, you know what? I trust that this is God's word. I'm coming and I'm putting my faith in his word. It's, it's his authority over my life. But it's daily bread. Come on, I want to encourage us. It's daily bread. Day by day this week, God's saying, hey, would you come eat? Would you come eat? Would you come sit with me? Would you come hang out with me? Come on, would you come dwell with me? Would you let me refine you? Maybe for us, it's just shaping, going, God, you know what? I need to come with my worldview and go, I want it to be biblical. I want it to be shaped by your word. But let's never forget that it's about Jesus. That it's when we come to his word that we're looking to see Jesus. We're transformed by his word because we see Jesus. Amen? Right across the auditorium, we just want to take a moment for every person here, just to ask yourself a simple question. Maybe you're new, maybe you're fresh, maybe you've been coming a little while and you're still walking this journey out. Today, I believe that God would love to extend the invitation to you that you would be saved, that you would have a relationship with Him. Maybe online you're joining us. I want to tell you God loves you. He has a purpose for you. He has a plan. And I'd love every single person right across the auditorium just to bow our heads, just to close our eyes, just for a moment of honesty. A moment where we can ask ourselves, am I right with God? The good news today is that no matter where you're at in your journey, no matter how you've walked into this place, you may come here and you're going, man, I don't feel worthy, I don't feel good enough for God. 
the reality of the gospel, the good news of Jesus is this, is that we've all fallen, that we're all broken, that we're all messed up, that we've all sinned, the Bible says, and fallen short of God's perfect standard of his righteousness, of his holiness. And that's the very reason Jesus himself came to earth 2,000 years ago. God came down in what we call the incarnation. He put skin on. He became human to live a perfect life and a sinless life so that he would go to the cross. And upon that cross, the Bible says that he, that the God laid the, the sin of the world upon Jesus, upon his own son, John 3, 16 says that for God so loved the world that he didn't want anyone to perish, that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, that whomsoever, no matter what you've done, where you've come from, whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. And friend, today, that is the gospel, that Jesus wants to come and give you a brand new life. And maybe your heart's going a million miles an hour. God's just knocking on your heart saying, would you come home today? In fact, in just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to lift your hand if that's you and say, God, here I am. I wanna give you my life on a surrender afresh. And then together as a church family, we're gonna say a prayer, a prayer of invitation, a prayer of repentance, a prayer that says, God, I'm here. I wanna surrender my life to you. So if that's you today and you're saying, Danny, I wanna be included in that prayer. I wanna give my life to Jesus. On the count of three, I'd love you just to lift your hand high. Say, Danny, I wanna give my life to Jesus. One, he loves you. Two, he has an incredible purpose for your life. And three, if that's you today, come on, why don't you lift your hand high and say, God, here I am. Incredible, mate, incredible, incredible, incredible. Four decisions this morning saying, God, I wanna give you my life. Four incredible people saying, God, here I am. Just a little moment longer. Maybe, maybe today you're going, man, I just don't think I could walk this out. I don't think I've got what it takes. I wanna tell you that there is enough grace for you. There is enough mercy for you. What Jesus did on the cross was powerful enough to give you a brand new life, to wipe away your sins. The Bible says he removes it. As far as the east is from the west, that means it's gone. He remembers, he chooses to remember it no more. Just one moment longer. If that's you today, lift your hands. Online, just click the button in front of you saying, I made a decision. Awesome. Awesome. Well, together, let's say this prayer together as a church family, especially for every person that raised your hand. Say, God, today, I choose to give you my life, to believe in you, Jesus, that you died and rose again for my sins, to make me right, to make me whole, to heal me, to deliver me, and to set me free. From this moment forward, I choose to follow you. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to lead me, to guide me as I walk this journey out in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen. Come on, let's celebrate the incredible four people that made that decision this morning. It's so good. It's so good. It's the best decision you could ever make. And online, maybe you made that decision too. And we'd just love to connect with you and, and help you on your journey, to give you a Bible. Um, we spoke about why the Bible today, but really it just starts by opening it up, no matter where you're at, and go, you know what, I want to I wanna start to read it, I want to start to open my life to it. And uh, we have connect groups. In fact, we've got a group, um, a, a course called Alpha, that we'd love to get you connected to because Alpha will really just help you walk out what it means to be a Christian. Talk about more around the Bible. Who is God? Who is Jesus? Any questions you have, you can bring to Alpha. So we'd love to just connect with you. Um, some of the team will be down right at the front here, just holding a Bible. So come connect with our team. And um, we'd just love to, love to connect with you more and help you on this journey. Amen? Come on, let's celebrate every single person again.